This is Radio Lab. I'm Jad Iwamran. I'm Robert Krulwich. Today on our program, The Science of Morality. Why don't we start with two morality thought experiments? This is a famous problem originally posed in 1967 by the philosopher Philippa Foote. There are two parts to this problem. You're going to have to make a choice at the end of each. Part one, you're near some train tracks. There are five workers on the tracks working. They've got their backs turned to the trolley, which is coming in the distance. They don't see it. You can't shout to them. And if you do nothing, here's what'll happen. Five workers will die. Oh my god! You can do A, nothing, or B, it so happens next to you is a lever. Pull the lever and the trolley will jump onto some side tracks where there is only one person working. So there's your choice. Do you kill one man by pulling a lever, or do you kill five men by doing nothing? Part two. You're standing near some train tracks. Five guys are in the tracks, just as before. They, however, we're going to make a couple changes. Now you're standing on a footbridge that passes over the tracks. You're looking down onto the tracks. There's no lever anywhere to be seen, except next to you, there is a guy, large individual, standing next to you on the bridge, looking down with you over the tracks, and you realize, wait, I can save those five workers if I push this man. Give him a little tap. <laughs> He'll land on the tracks and... He stopped, stopped the, the train. <laughs> right. Oh, man, yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. But surely you realize the math is the same. Yeah, but I'm this time. I'm pushing the guy. If you ask, is it okay to kill one man to save five using a lever? Nine out of ten people will say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. But if you ask them, is it okay to kill one man to save five by pushing the guy? Nine out of ten people will say no. 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 Never. No. No. It is practically. Universal. Educational level, no effect. Male versus female, no effect. Mark Hauser, professor at Harvard, posed the trolley scenarios to hundreds of thousands of people on the internet found the same thing. Everyone agrees. Then he asked them why. Why is murder okay when you're pulling a lever, but not okay when you're pushing the guy? Consistently, they found people, people have, have no, no clue. clue. Pulling the lever to save the five. I don't know, that feels better than pushing the one to save the five. <laughs> and if having a moral sense is a unique and special human quality, then maybe we should at least inquire as to why this happens. And I have met somebody who has a hunch. His name is Josh Green. He's a young guy at Princeton University, and he spent the last few years trying to figure out where this inconsistency comes from. Forget whether or not these judgments are right or wrong. What's going on in the brain that makes people distinguish so naturally and intuitively between these two cases, which are very, very, very similar, if not identical? In our heads, we may find where these feelings of revulsion or acceptance come from. In the basement of Princeton, there was this 180,000-pound brain scanner. What Josh does is he invites people into this room, has them lie down, and he rolls them into the machine. Their heads are braced, and then he tells them stories. He tells them the same two trolley tales told before, and then at the very instant that they're deciding whether I should push the lever or whether I should push the man, the scanner snaps pictures of their brains. I'll show you some, some stuff. And the first slide that he showed me was a human brain being asked the question, would you pull the lever? And the answer in most cases was yes. Yeah, I'd pull the lever. When the brain's saying yes, you'd see little kind of peanut-shaped spots of yellow. This little guy right here and these two guys right there. The brain was being active in these places. And oddly enough, whenever people said yes, <laughs> yes, yes. to the lever question, the very same pattern lit up. Then he showed me another slide. This was a slide of a brain saying, no. No, I would not push the man. I will not push the large man. And in this picture, this one we're looking at here, this, it was a totally different constellation of regions that lit up. A theory not proven, but I think that this is what I think the evidence suggests. That the human brain doesn't hum along like one big unified system. In your brain, in every brain, you'll find little warring tribes, little subgroups. You've got one part of the brain that says, huh, five lives versus one life? Wouldn't it be better to say five versus one? And that's the part that would glow when you answer, yes, I'd pull the lever. Yeah, pull the lever. But there's this other part of the brain which really, really doesn't like personally killing another human being and gets very upset at the fat man case and shouts, in effect, no! No! You know, it understands it on that level and says, no! 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 Bad! Don't do! No, but don't think I've got No, no. 
never a person. No. Instead of having sort of one system that just sort of churns out the answer in Bing, we have multiple systems that give different answers and they duke it out and hopefully out of that competition comes morality. This is not a trivial discovery, that you struggle to find right and wrong depending upon what part of your brain is shouting the loudest. I just don't know. Josh is kind of a radical in this respect. He thinks it's biological, I mean deeply biological, that somehow we inherit from the deep past a sense of right and wrong that's already in our brains you know, from the get-go, before mom and dad. Our, our primate ancestors, before we were full-blown humans, had intensely social lives. They have social mechanisms that prevent them from doing all the nasty things that they might otherwise be interested in doing. And so deep in our brain, we have what you might call basic primate morality. And basic primate morality doesn't understand things like tax evasion, but it does understand things like pushing your buddy off of a cliff. Oh, so I have hundreds of thousands of years of training in my brain that says, don't murder the large man. Right. Now, that case, I think it's a pretty easy case. Even though it's five versus one, in that case, people just go with what we might call the inner chimp. But there are other... <laughs> right. Well, what's interesting is that we think of, of basic human morality as being handed down from on high. And it's probably better to say that it was handed up from below. That our most basic core moral values are not the things that we humans have invented, but the things that we've actually inherited from other people. The stuff that we humans have invented are the things that seem more peripheral and variable. You're suggesting that hundreds of thousands of years of on-the-ground training have gotten our brains to think, don't kill your kin. That should be your default response. I mean, certainly chimpanzees are extremely violent, and they do kill each other, but they don't do it as a matter of, of course. They, so to speak, have to have some context-sensitive reason for doing so. When you have these gut feelings, when we talk about our gut, I know in my gut this is right or this is wrong, really in that moment, that's evolution talking to a guy who specializes in chimps. My name is Franz de Waal, and I'm a professor at Emory University. Uh, I also work at the Yorkish Primate Center in Atlanta, Georgia. He would agree that human morality is not special. All you have to do is watch chimps do their thing for five minutes to see that. He keeps his chimps in big stadium-type enclosures. They're like gladiator rings with high walls and no roof. And off to one side, there's an observation tower. We climbed the ladder to the observation tower so we could see the chimps down below. Fifteen chimps were milling around in the heat. And then Franz drops the branch into the enclosure and lands thud 20 feet below, right in front of a female. That's a young female, Katie, who takes it. There's one female coming over. They're not going to be happy to share. You see? There's a fight. So there's a fight, but do you hear how it stops like that? What happened was that the alpha male, number one chimp, comes out. And then everyone shuts up. The alpha male is coming over. He's here. And then after him comes number two. Now the second male has taken the food. And then the two of them stand together for a while. Who knows what they're doing, but eventually number two takes the branch and walks toward the back of the enclosure. You see he's being followed by females. At the back of the enclosure is a hut, a little building. And one by one, all 15 chimps file in after him. Now they're going in the building with the branch, which is bad for us, because we may not hear a lot. Ron's told us what they're doing. He's seen it a million times. This is how they share. They will probably uh, divide the thing, and then uh, some individuals will have a large branch, and then they will start sharing with the rest. Well, see, they have the system. Anytime some food lands in the enclosure and the juveniles get it and they can't decide who gets what, the adults will take it, lead everyone into the hut, where they will divide the branch into pieces. Usually, in the end, everybody gets something. If we do something nice, we call it humane behavior meaning that we borrow from our species name to describe it. But it's actually a very ancient tendency. Ancient, Franz says, because the only way our primate ancestors made it this far was through cooperation. And that's the key. That doesn't mean that there's no nastiness. Chimps do fight. They do kill each other. But on the whole, they get along. So, of course, if you fall and stumble and bleed and are in trouble, 
I should respond to that because my survival also depends on how you are doing. If you were to remove the capacity for empathy from morality, the whole thing falls apart. Then it just becomes a bunch of rules. And you can see very striking instances of empathy in, in the apes. He literally has a hundred different examples. But here's a really good one. There's this famous case in the Brookfield Zoo where a gorilla rescued a boy who had fallen into the enclosure. Uh, this happened like 10 years ago. It was a parent's nightmare. A three-year-old boy had climbed over a railing and fallen 18 feet into the gorilla pit. As he lay injured and unconscious on the concrete, Binti gently scooped him up. Then she did something amazing. She carried him probably about 50 or 60 feet. And then she brought him to a place where people could get to him. There were people there videotaping it. It's incredible. I never thought a gorilla would do that. No. And, and a big deal was made of it in the media. But actually the response of that gorilla to the boy who had fallen in was a very common, typical ape response. I still think there's a difference between human beings and apes and monkeys. It's a tangible difference. This is a Josh Green story. The situation is somewhat similar to the last episode of MASH, but the way we tell the story, it goes like this. It's wartime, you're hiding in the basement with some of your fellow villagers, and the enemy soldiers are outside. They have orders to kill anyone that they find. So there you are, you're huddled in the basement. All around you are enemy troops, and you're holding your baby. Your baby with a cold, a bit of a sniffle. And you know that your baby could cough at any moment. If they hear your baby, they're going to find you and the baby and everyone else, and they're going to kill everybody. And the only way you can stop this from happening is cover the baby's mouth. But if you do that, the baby's going to smother and die. Would you smother your own baby to save the village? Or would you let your baby cough knowing the consequences? And this is a very tough question. People take a long time to think about it. And some people say yes, and some people say no. In the final MASH episode, she murders her baby. She, she killed it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I just wanted it to be quiet. It was a baby. he asked people the question, would you murder your own child? He took pictures of their brains. The contest we described before was global. It was like a world war in the brain. And this was a different kind of contest than the ones we talked about before. There it was distinct. Here, I don't think really anybody wins. When you are in this moment with parts of your brain contesting, there are two brain regions right behind your eyebrows, left and right, that light up. And they are the things that monkeys don't have as much of that we have? Yeah, where it's both emotional, but there's also a sort of a rational attempt to sort of sort through those emotions. Those are the cases that are showing more activity in that area. In these close contests, whenever those nodes are very, very active, it appears that the calculating section of the brain gets a bit of a boost and the visceral inner chimp section of the brain is kind of muffled. <coughs> the people who made what is essentially a logical decision, who chose to kill their children, over and over had brighter glows in these two areas and longer glows in these two areas. So there is a definite association between these two dots above the eyebrow and the power of the logical brain over the inner chimp or the visceral brain. And how many people chose to kill their baby? About half. What, what would you do? Me? You wouldn't even consider. I would kill the baby. The village will go on to have a hundred babies. You're going to erase all those people based on your well, child? Wait, first of all, the audience should know that Jan Abumna does not have a child of his own yet. <laughs> so you, you, True. you can't... I, I don't know what I would do really, but if you're just asking me right now in the abstract which is more right, well, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't act on behalf of the greater good. That's the one expression that uh, the apes don't have, as far as I know. Shame and guilt. I'm not sure that they are particularly well developed in the chimpanzee. Uh, my name is Judy Smetana. I'm a professor at the University of Rochester. Kids clearly know more than they can say. It's clear from both observations and anecdotes that children really are beginning to develop a moral sense. 
in the second year of life. Of course, that experience increases as they move into the threes, but they're also beginning to form a much more complex or developed understanding of moral rules, which they can share with us a little bit um, in our interviews. When you do the interviews with kids directly, what kind of questions are you asking them? Well, we try to ask them um, really some very complex ideas in a simple form, such as, would it be okay to hit if you're teacher didn't see you, or would it be okay to hit if there was no rule about it in your school? Suppose the teachers at school agree that they won't have any rule about hitting at school. There's um, no rule anymore. Then would it be okay for a boy to hit another kid hard? Um, no. No? And what we found is that young children, beginning at about three, but really much more reliably by age four, will say that things like hitting or hurting or teasing would be wrong even if the teacher didn't see them or didn't have a rule. Whereas other things like, you know, sitting in the circle in circle time would be okay if there was no rule about it. Is that a rule the teacher could change? Yes. If she says, okay, you could stand up, you could do that. You have to listen to the teacher. So it's clear that the moral universe begins um, very early for young children. I mean, one of the things that we see is that young children can tell you that things are wrong, that it's wrong to hit because it hurts, wrong to take toys. At the same, At the same time, time, kids do take other kids' toys. They do hit each other. But if they know it's wrong, why are they doing this? Because it feels good. Yeah, it feels good because they got what they wanted. Some researchers have called that the happy victimizer effect. The task of a young child's development is to be able to coordinate those two perspectives, that of the, the victim and that of the transgressor, and kind of weight it toward the way the victim feels. So what we're really talking about is like a happy victimizer versus empathy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I would say that the absence of empathy is one of the characteristics of really young kids. They're a little bit like sociopaths. <laughs> Do you think that's overstating it? I think so. You know, in a very general way, that's true. But I, I mean, I think we ha uh, we are born with some very rudimentary sense of empathy, hardwired in. People are very persuaded, for instance, by the primate evidence. That's something that you see in other species. But I do think that kids are born with different innate levels of empathy. And to be going to school early one day, and they have an observation closet where you can watch the classroom, and I had not ever observed <laughs> because I'm never early, so I went into the closet. And at that moment, I saw Jack tackle his best friend, drop behind a bookcase, the rest of the classroom gather around. Then I saw Jack stand up and just look down with this very startled, frightened look on his face. And then I saw his friend stand up with his lip bleeding. He was mortified by the whole thing. He was mortified, I think scared about his own actions. And I'm four. Jack had to see the consequences of his own actions on his own terms. Today on Radio Lab, the podcast. We're going to check in with somebody who you might remember. Uh, I'm Joshua Green at Harvard University. I study moral judgment and decision making. In that earlier Radio Lab, right. we described the last episode of the TV show Mad. There's an enemy patrol coming down the road. Let's kill those lights. You're huddled in the basement. All around you are enemy troops, and you're holding your baby with a cold. If you don't cover the baby's mouth, soldiers are going to find everybody, and everybody's going to be killed, including you, including your baby. Now that you have a child, and you've looked into that child's face <laughs> over and over and over again, what would you do? I have thought about this. Now this is not just like an abstract baby, but it's my baby. Well, that does change everything, obviously, so I frankly don't know. I don't know. Truthfully, I would not kill my baby. I'd have to sacrifice a principle. Sometimes you have to sacrifice something very dear for the greater good. That's a really important idea to me. You know, if you're the philosopher king and you give me two options, one is to kill my baby to save the village, or to allow my baby to live, in which case everybody dies, I still feel like you kind of have to kill the baby. But I don't think any father could do that.
So the idea is that you know when you think about this case, on the one hand, you have an intuitive emotional response that says, no, this is terrible, killing a baby or killing my own baby, even worse. At the same time, a different system within your brain is saying, look, this is as horrible as this is, this is a sensible thing to do. It's the only sensible thing to do because if you do nothing, everyone will die. Whereas if you kill the baby, then at least you and the other people can live. And uh, what, what the evidence suggests is that these two competing moral perspectives are really grounded in different parts of the brain and the competition competition has not been resolved. So that's where we were the last time. Right. Now I want to step forward for a second and think about it um, a little more deeply. All right. If our sense of right and wrong comes from like these competing brain systems, let me revisit the question, are our brains built to favor certain outcomes? Hmm. Let's suppose that you are walking alongside a lake and you see a, a, a girl drowning right in front of you and she's screaming for help, but you're wearing a very expensive suit. Hmm. Should you jump into the lake and save her? No. <laughs> no, of course, of course you should, yes. <laughs> you mean like the suit is the only thing that's, that right. would prevent so me from doing that? Yeah. Yeah, 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 jump in. But now suppose you're walking down past your mailbox and there's a letter in the mailbox which says, Please give us $1,000 so we can help save girls on the other side of the globe. Girls you'll never meet, girls whose screams you'll never hear, but there are girls in trouble on the other side of the world. Go help them. And so wait, so the, the equivalence is that you jump into the lake, you save the girl who's drowning. One on one. Or yeah. you send the check and you save the girl who is so, uh, in peril in, in some peril, way. Yeah. A girl, not a that girl. girl, a girl, a girl somewhere on the other side of the globe. I see. So the question in, uh, that, to go to Josh is, if you didn't give the $1,000, would that make you a bad guy? Right. Well, there is something funny about these cases, right, that, that most of us say that, of course, you have to, to, to rescue the drowning child, but you know, it's, you're not a saint if you don't give your money over to, to, to save the children on the other side of the world. But you're certainly not a terrible person or so it seems to us. And so, yes, there's this... There's this uh, Putting aside whether it's a good or bad, whether you're a good or bad person, sure. how do you explain the difference? Well, I, I think it makes a lot of evolutionary sense. Uh, that is, you know, a lot of our social emotional responses are geared towards life in the kind of environment in which our ancestors evolved. And it makes sense that we would have uh, moral buttons, so to speak, that get pushed by the kinds of things that our ancestors might have encountered. Because tens of thousands of years of evolution have, have essentially been quietly tugging at your heart in, both, in those kinds of situations. Exactly, exactly. Whereas the idea of spending a minimal amount of money to save the life of some stranger on the other side of the world that, you've never, that you're never going to meet, that's a totally new modern phenomenon. It's not something that our emotions are prepared for. Well, now, doesn't that leave us in a funny place? Because I think, I think it does. What happens if the most important questions that we face as a species or as a group involve thinking abstractly? Yep. Those problems, pollution, global warming, and things like that, those aren't really local problems. They're global problems. Exactly. This is, I think, it gets right at the heart of the matter. And this is why I do this research. I think that the kind of thinking that we apply to those problems, what we call common sense, is really hunter-gatherer common sense, or at least a lot of it is. If we're going to face these big problems that our minds were not designed by evolution to handle, then we have to learn to turn off parts of our brain that are getting in the way and turn on other parts that may seem like the wrong parts to be using. So he's saying that we should tamp down our primitive emotional instincts that are in our reptile brain. Let those instincts that say, don't kill your baby, like that stuff. And then we should amp up somehow the part of us that thinks more abstractly about the greater good and about people that aren't uh, right in front of us. Yeah. So, so if you're sitting there with a soda can in your hand and you think, I guess I can just throw this on the street. And you go, clink, clinkity, 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 clink. Part, your primitive part is saying, well, I can get away with that because yeah. no one's seeing it. But, of course, the calculating part would say, well, if we all do this, then the world will be full of trash. And it's problems like that that in order to solve them, you have to yeah, think abstractly. We encountered this already. He's asking us to rely on a part of our brain that is not exactly Hercules. Do you remember the, the thing we talked about in the, the Choice show with Baba Shiv? I'm uh, Baba Shiv. I'm a professor here at uh, the Stanford Graduate School of Business in Marketing. A lot of my research has to do with the brain. And tricking people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he got a bunch of subjects together. He said, okay, I'm going to give you all a number. Give me a number. 
on a little card. You're going to read the number, and I want you to commit that number to memory. You're now going to walk to the next room and recall the number. And that's what subjects think that they're going to be doing. What they don't know is that not everybody is getting the same kind of number. So some people get a seven-digit number. Some people get a two-digit number. Just imagine a person with a two-digit number in their head was walking out of room one, one down the hall. At the same time, someone with seven digits in their head one, two, two, eight, nine, three, six, walks down the hall. Two, eight, nine, now here is where the trickery comes in. As they're walking down the hall, mid-memorizing, all of a sudden they oh. pass a lady in the hallway, and she's holding something. So, would you like a snack? Uh, sh- uh, sure. Okay. Choose between either A, a big fat slice of chocolate cake, or B, a nice bowl of fruit salad. Hmm. What would you like? Some yummy cake mm. or some healthy fruit? Here's the weird thing: people with two digits I- in their head almost always choose the fruit, whereas the people with seven digits in their head almost always choose the cake. Yeah. And we're talking by huge margins here. It was significant. I mean, this was like in some cases a twenty, twenty-five, thirty-point difference. Your rational system, the hope of humankind part of your brain, is very, very suggestible, weak, and barely struggling to manage the situation. Imagine if you told those people, "Look, here's how your mind works. When you have to mem- remember a long number, it's going to clog up your memory, and it's going to make it harder for you to resist the temptation to have chocolate cake instead of fruit salad." But I'm telling you this now: you're armed with the truth about how your own mind works. Here's a long number. Go. Now, how many of those people are going to be able to resist the chocolate cake? I, I think a lot more of them are. I'm willing to place bets on how that will turn out. We can recognize the quirks and the flaws and the inconsistencies in our cognitive systems and do something better that makes more sense. Is this just blind optimism? One, one thing that gives me hope is something called the Flynn effect. Something that was noticed by a philosopher and now political scientist named Jim Flynn. Excellent. The Flynn effect. What Flynn noticed is that over the course of the 20th century, IQ scores kept going up and up and up in the industrialized world. So much so that, by his estimates. A person of average intelligence in nineteen hundred would register somewhere near the line、uh, for mental retardation by present standards. It's a bit complicated because the tests have changed and the norms have changed. But doing your best to control for all of that, by his estimates, we have gained about thirty IQ points as a society in the last hundred years, which is enormous.、Hmm. Now, how could this be? If you ask Josh, well, why would we be getting better at the IQ test? He says that in the last hundred years, people learned how to think abstractly. Things that we take for granted, like a market, where a market is not a particular place with fruit stands, but a more abstract space, so to speak, in which goods and services are exchanged for money. Things like that have become part of our cognitive backdrop. These are deeply abstract. Occupation. I think Josh is arguing that it can change you. Cultural evolution essentially has given us much higher IQs when it comes to thinking about a lot of things. It's like learning to play an instrument, right? I mean, when you first start playing guitar, you're totally useless. It sounds like a dying animal. Give it, give it a couple of years, and it can sound great. And basically, I mean, you think that you can exercise yourself into being a better man and a better woman and a better species. I think that's right. I think that we can learn to play our dorsolateral prefrontal cortices better. At the end of the day, you think that the pressure of dealing with these big abstract problems will eventually change. Our minds. Well, I hope so. I mean, the problem is that as a species, we tend to learn from trial and error. The problem with issues like nuclear proliferation and global warming is that we only have one Earth, and if we have to learn the lesson from some kind of trial and error, the errors are not so big that we don't get another chance. But I also think that there is reason for optimism. That may just be because I'm an optimistic person. I mean, I might just sort of throw up my hands and say, "Forget it. I'll go do something else. Enjoy my time before we kill ourselves." But I think that <laughs> it's worth. A shot to see if we can teach ourselves to live、uh, happily on a small planet. I certainly think anyone normal would be rooting for you. Absolutely. Well, thanks. I、yeah. appreciate that. There are a lot of abnormal people who root for me, but I hope there are some <laughs> normal ones too. Josh Green is an assistant professor of psychology at Harvard University. He's written these ideas in an essay in a volume called "What's Next," edited by Max. Brockman. And hey, did you when you were talking with him? Did you ask him、uh, about、uh, his babies? What, would he kill his babies? You、so、know, I、good? should. I forgot.
Mm-hmm. Well, if if this moral sense gets turned on when you're three or four, mm-hmm. there are some moments in your life where you get so embarrassed by something that you did that your moral sense never turns off. And that's the next story. It comes from producer Amy O'Leary. For her, that moment came in the fourth grade. Amy felt so bad that many years later, she wrote her teacher a letter, and he never responded. So she went to see him. How are you? Still teaching. Probably have still six or seven years left to go. How many? How 34. Many, 34 years. Yeah, I've been teaching probably longer than half the staff's been alive. <laughs> you still play Homestead? Yes, we're still trying to do it. You just you just grabbed your forehead and had yeah. this look of anguish. What was that for? <laughs> this class. Um, this has been a difficult class. Some of them will do it, some of them won't, some of them will remember it. You remembered it. Did everyone in the class remember it? I already knew the answer to that. Because I'd checked. Yeah. I found Jeff in L.A. Jeff, do you remember Homestead? Mm, vaguely. And Dale in Phoenix? Dale, do you remember the Homestead game that we played? Um, vaguely. And Stefa, who I met at a bar in Brooklyn where she works. Do you remember Homestead, the game? No, not as much as you do, obviously. Yeah, I remembered it. <laughs> Once you start talking about it, I may remember right. it. So it was the simulation game that we were supposed to be, um, like, prairie settlers, right? Yeah. And there's this big plywood map at the front of the classroom, and we had these little booklets that were sort of black and white booklets. These are the, um, booklets you used. Wow. Standing in his classroom, I remember everything about the game. I, I hold this and I have a flood of memories. I remember the power and the slum warding, the price gouging. But I think the purpose of the game was to teach us something about the history of the kinds of people who had to settle the West. You were assigned a character and a plot of land. And every day you played it, each individual student would have a different fortune. You might roll a one, and there'd be a drought, and you wouldn't get any money off of your land. Or you'd roll a six, and that meant there was a bumper crop. I mean, it was a lot like a Monopoly game. I've got the board there. Just as luck would have it, one of the very first things that happened, Mr. Riggs announced, the square in the middle there, land square 18, my land, would be the center of town. So you got to sell all the town property and kind of run the town. Mm -hmm. I knew at the time it would help me win the game. I thought, this is lucky. I have something that nobody else has. I mean, I thought it was further evidence that I was special. I started by forming a company. We'd go to a kid. We'd say, hey, do you want to join our company? What's that? Well, we're going to be a company, and we're going to be all together. You give us your land, and we'll give you a place in the town to live. Everybody wants to move to the town. Meanwhile, I'll take all the profits from your farmland crops could get 200 to a thousand dollars a year on your land and then we would pay them fifty dollars a year nobody actually had to go out and work their fields to reap the profits off the land but these people basically sold themselves into a very low wage kind of slavery situation and all the other nine-year-olds went for this peer pressure they thought we were the cool kids they would all say yes. That's what I remember. It was like almost no one turned us down. And once you've got 20 kids who are part of the company, oh my God, I can do whatever I want. Crazy total power. <laughs> like anything. Any bullying tactic. I mean, there were do. things that would come up, like the booklet would say, okay, your family's having a medical problem. You need to pay the doctor. My baby's sick. My baby's sick. The doctor worked for our company. The doctor would overcharge the people who were not in the company. If you were not part of the company, it was going to cost you a lot of money. More money than any of these people had. And that wasn't even the worst of it. I somewhat remember that whole episode of... That's Dale again. ...of us having to actually stop the game early. He didn't remember much, but he remembered the money. Well, the game used Monopoly money. Once we got big enough where we realized nobody could really track our finances, we actually brought in life money and Monopoly money from home and, like, flooded the classroom currency market. It was an absurd amount of money. In hindsight, I thought that you had to notice that. It was kind of noticeable, <laughs> because I was stamping the the money with a Groucho Marx stamp. That was the real stuff. It, no class has taken it as far as you guys did. So I remember this meeting. You brought us all up to the front of the room, and six kids, frustrated, gathered around one side of Mr. Riggs' big teacher's desk. I stood on the other. And you said, we don't exactly think this is fair, but you didn't tell us it was wrong, or that you're cheating, or you're counterfeiting money, and I know it. What I remember was that you raised the question. He asked me, 
what are you going to do about this? A long pause. He wasn't punishing me, or saying it was against the rules exactly. I couldn't figure out what was going on. We were winning. What was I going to do about it? Nothing, I told him. And that's when he gave me this look. It was almost like there was sort of a quiet disappointment that you'd had. Like, all the hope he'd had for me as a human being just slid right off his face. Did that help develop a conscience in you? Did that ever, has that ever come back so that you think about things differently? Utterly. Like, that's, that's exactly why I've remembered this for so long and so well. It stuck with me as, as this... Um, lesson of even if you're not going to get punished it still can be wrong because then it was successful if that has happened it was one of those teachable moments everybody does things when they're that age that make you feel bad to learn what's right or wrong right my classmate dale put things into perspective do you have things like that yeah um Travis Sherman was a friend of mine that, that lived in the neighborhood, and we were the best of friends, you know, riding our bikes around town. And we were coming home, crossing a freeway off-ramp, and I was in front of Travis. I made it across, and the next thing I remember hearing is just squealing tires, and I look around, and Travis is half underneath this car out in the intersection. I remember him kind of half standing up, and his leg was folded up like origami almost just trashed and he just kind of looked up at me and said oh god Dale my leg and he fell back down yeah, I, I couldn't have been more than six but I just turned around and I got on my bike and I just rode off I don't even think I told my mom about it he tried calling from the hospital several times and I just remember going, no, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. My mom finally says, no, you're going to talk to him whether you like it or not. And when I finally did get on the phone, I just clearly remember him asking me, why did you do that? How come he didn't come back for me? And I didn't have an answer for him. To this day, it's one of those things that still bothers me that I would do that, that I would turn around and leave somebody who needs help like that. Maybe that factors into how I am as a person today. You know, it's like, I'll help anybody I can just because I don't want to have that feeling again. I asked Dale if he could erase that day from his life. Would he? No, he said, not in a million years. It's part of who he is now. And who he is now is the kind of guy who will come and pick you up in the middle of the desert when your car breaks down at 3 a.m. No questions asked. He's a really loyal friend. A good person. I didn't go back to see Mr. Briggs to resolve anything. I didn't need him to say that deep down he always thought I was a good kid or that he's no longer disappointed in me. What matters is that once he was disappointed in me. And I think about that all the time. Um, is there a right? Is there a wrong? They're sorting through that. Kids this age, eight, nine years old. Yeah. What is morality? Is it a sense of fairness? I mean, these kids have got fairness down to the nth degree. They can look at one of these cupcakes and tell you to the ounce which one's bigger, and if somebody else gets it, it's not fair. Is that morality? There are several kids, whether it's genetics or very early family background, that I don't think will ever have a grasp of that. When you see a child that consistently pokes, cuts, cheats, steals, lies, whatever, and I'm saying at three, at four, at five, not just in third grade, I think that child's cursed, doomed, whatever, for the rest of their lives. But I think if people are left alone, that they have a tendency to do the right thing. Kids have the tendency to do the right thing. 